once a month and uh, we are very open to hearing uh, what your desires and needs are for topics. Clearly this is one that has sparked interest. Um, sometimes we rerun them, sometimes uh, and we often take uh, input from people. So if you've got a burning idea for something else that you want to uh, learn about at one of these sessions, then please let me know. I'm, uh, come on in, come on in. Um, I'm Karen August, I'm the Manager of Membership Services here, and uh, we have recently opened this uh, Lunchbox Learning Session up to our partner, uh, WBN. Uh, so, is there anybody here who is a WBN member and is here because of that mm -hmm. connection? Well, that's okay. Um, <laughs> so, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. This is exactly what we want to see. Um, WBN and, and Chamber of Commerce are best of friends, and we actually have somebody sitting on each of the other's boards, uh, and uh, this is a great partnership. So welcome, uh, welcome to uh, Chamber of um, the, uh, the topic today is very timely. Um, it's, uh, this is the month to do it. We've got Bell Let's Talk Day coming up on January 28th. Um, and I'm not going to take any more of your time because I'm going to let the subject matter experts. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Kerry Davis, who is the manager of development C development at CMHA. Um, she is a huge community resource, and uh, I'm sure that most of you uh, have met her. And if you haven't, now is your opportunity. So thanks for coming today and doing this. Thanks for the work. Oh, and I have to say uh, thank you to our sponsor of the whole Lunchbox Learning Series, who is Bell. Bell, Bell, Bell. There you go. <laughs> Thanks to them. Thanks very much, Karen. And as we know, January 28th is Bell Let's Talk Day, and uh, Bell has been amazing uh, partner partners for CMHA in particular, but I think great has shown great leadership uh, in the community for an organization that has really stepped forward and made sure that we are having the conversations about mental health and erasing the stigma. Um, did anybody here have the opportunity to see Claire Hughes when she rolled into town last March? Just absolutely incredible woman. Um, we're actually, uh, next week of Hell Let's Talk Day, we're kind of bringing the whole Claire Hughes event full circle, and we're going to be at James Strauss School at one o'clock in the afternoon partnering with Bell to have, uh, we'll be part of a candlewide, um, I don't know what the right word is for it, not a teleconference because we'll be connecting with the media when Claire speaks in Toronto on, on Bell Let's Talk Day. And the reason we've chosen James Strass School is they were the school that created the blue bike that appeared in so many events over the um, uh, few months after Claire left, including the Chamber of Commerce Golf Tournament. Uh, again, thanks to Bell. So uh, it's wonderful to be uh, ongoing partners with the organization. And of course, with me today is Jack Beach, who is our educator and health promoter with CMHJ. He's been in that role for just coming up two years in April. And before that, Jack spent about five years uh, in our organization working in corrections and the release from custody program. Uh, of those Central East Corrections. So he's had some, uh, certainly some hands-on, real-life experiences working with our clients and with the community. Um, so if anyone's interested in finding any more about that, Jack is certainly a resource. But what he's been doing the last two years, of course, is helping us uh, to continue in the community to have a dialogue about mental health, to find educational opportunities uh, in workplaces, in volunteer organizations, uh, We've worked very closely with a number of groups getting information and opportunities out for suicide prevention, which Jeff will be talking to a little later. So um, he's a great resource. I think you'll find today your, your time over this lunch will be well spent. He's uh, an excellent facilitator. And the pressure, really right? Yeah. No pressure, Jack. Well, you know, he's coming up in April. Um, but he, he, really, um, he really can uh, uh, explain, explain the topic well and uh, great at responding to questions. So, uh, further ado, I will turn over to the expert. Thank you. I have to say, no pressure, it's just a video camera by supervisor. So we'll see how this goes. So I've entitled uh, this afternoon's Lunch and Learn Improving Mental Health, How to Promote a Mentally Healthy Workplace for You and Your Employees. So like I was so kindly introduced, I'm just going to set this here, don't click it, it'll flip the slides. My name is Jack Beach, I'm the Health Motor Educator with the Canadian Mental Health Association. So that means I go out to schools, I go to companies, I go to workplaces, I teach about mental health, mental illness, but in a general sense, I teach people how to stay well. I teach courses in suicide intervention. 
uh, things like assist and safe talk. I also teach mental health first aid. And as part of the Talk Today program, I work as the mental health coach for our local Peterborough Peets. Like Carrie said, prior to doing all that, I work in a frontline capacity, working one-to-one -one with those who are living with mental illness, working right out of our Central East Correctional Center, our big old jail out in Lindsay. So I work one-to-one -one with inmates who are either diagnosed with mental illness, or had a suspected mental illness, and had a system when they got released from custody. So to help find a place to live, or a family doctor, a psychiatrist, whatever they identified as their needs. So four or five years was enough of that. Got a nice cushy desk job now, a little bit nicer. So let's jump into the reason about why I'm here. So first off, I hope to be able to teach you guys some new terminology today surrounding mental health and wellness. We're going to discuss the difference between mental health and mental illness. I find a lot of times uh, when I do these talks or I talk to people in the community, they are almost, almost used as interchangeable terms. We want to be really clear what the difference is between mental health and mental illness. I hope to be able to answer a lot of your questions about mental illness. So again, um, if you have a question or a thought or a comment, just raise your hand or, or shout it out. I really, truly hate when people are asked to save their questions to the very end. Because I know for myself, my attention span is short. By the time I reach the end of the presentation, I'm thinking about what I'm going to have for lunch or what I just ate, not what my questions were. So if there's a question at any point, please ask it. And we can hopefully change this into a discussion rather than just a lecture or being talked at. And lastly, we're going to review some tools or strategies available for employers to help promote a mentally healthy workplace. We're going to talk about three key ways that we suggest as CMHA for you to create a mentally healthy work environment for both you and your employees. So let's start a little bit of statistical information. We know mental health problems continue to be the leading cause of both short and long-term disability in Canada. When we talk about preventing injury, we're gonna talk a lot about that when we talk about the psychological health and safety in the workplace standards. A lot of times what gets overlooked is preventing psychological injury. And we're gonna talk about how doing so isn't necessarily a burden, but something that's really exciting that can help your organization do all kinds of great things. We know in 2010, mental health conditions were responsible for 47% of all approved disability claims in the federal service, civil service. That's almost double of the last 20 years earlier. So you can see this isn't something that's going away, this is something that's actually a growing concern. And in January of 2013, uh, the government of Canada enacted our created the Psychological Health and Safety in the Workplace Standards. So again, this is a really exciting document. If you love reading standards, and I'm sure everybody in this room, we have HR people here, roughly? People that love reading standards, I'm sure. You can see the smiles on the face and the glazed over look in the back of the room. So a really exciting document that can help us uh, as employers to run a more effective and, again, psychologically healthy workplace. What I really want to start with, though, before we get too much into what we can do, is I want to build a baseline for knowledge. And I want to really talk about what is mental health and what is mental illness. And like I said earlier, I find a lot of times when people think someone is struggling or that someone's in distress, that's when they use that term mental health. Like this person's really struggling. There's some mental health there. There's, there's a concern. But we all have mental health, just like we all have physical health. And we can be mentally healthy, just the same as we can be physically healthy. And we can become mentally ill, just the same as we can become physically ill. Imagine them as a spectrum, and for today's purposes, we're just going to use a straight line spectrum between becoming well and ill. And if you see a person starting to drift towards becoming unwell, you might see what we call mental health problems. Common struggles and difficulties that affect everybody from time to time. We can all experience those mental health problems. When we're talking about mental illness, now we're talking about a diagnosable condition that usually requires medical treatment or medical intervention. So I'm going to show you guys a chart. I know some of you have seen my talks before and seen my charts. Full disclosure, I stole this chart from a psychiatrist. I have to just be honest. Don't tell my boss. <laughs> We're going to talk about the differences between that mental health problem and mental illness. So we'll call it a, a balance wheel or a balance circle. And in a perfect world, we're going to be right in the center of this circle, right in the perfect balance. Anybody here in perfect balance right now? <laughs> Nobody? Not even a humor to hand up? Okay, so we got a lot of work to do. So, <laughs> in a perfect world, we're right in the middle of that circle. And there are four key factors, there are four main things in our lives that are going to pull us away from that center that are going to lead us towards becoming unwell. Essentially, four key factors that lead to every and any mental illness. And they're listed all around the outside there trauma, genetics, workplace stress, and personal stress. When I say things like personal stress or workplace stress, 
that would encompass the environment of those places. So the environment of that home life or that person stress, the environment of that workplace or school, albeit where that person's at their life, is going to be encompassed in those four things. And when those things pull us away from our center a little bit, we start to see that mental health problem the common struggles and difficulties that affect everybody from time to time. So we start to see things like low energy, or worry or fear, distraction or withdrawal, or even sometimes high energy. When we cross the threshold from what is a mental health problem to what is a mental illness, the key phrase we want to remember is on the inside of that circle as well, as what we call impaired function. Can we no longer achieve or complete our activities of daily living, things we have to do every single day just to get by, just to survive, because now these symptoms are so present, or they're so exacerbated. So what's an activity of daily living? What's something we have to do every single day just to get by? Anybody? Get out of bed. Get out of bed. Hang on, that's the one. What else? Eat. Eat. Eat was resounding. Eat's a good one too. What else? Hygiene. Hygiene, absolutely. We've got to come to work, get our work done on time, maybe make dinner or go shopping, care for loved ones. All these are what we call ADLs, activities of daily living. And when these symptoms become so present that they interfere with our ability to complete those ADLs, people will live that life to our fullest potential. Now we've crossed that threshold from problem to illness. And all of a sudden, something like low energy can change to depression. Worry or fear can become anxiety or phobias. Distraction or withdrawal can change to psychosis. And high energy, even to me. I do other talks, I, I get much more in-depth talking about specific mental illnesses and how they impact us and what they look like and how it starts to impair our functioning. Really for today, that's not going to be the main focus of what I'm doing. But really the idea of when does something really become an illness versus just I have a friend or a neighbor or a colleague or a family member and they act a certain way that's maybe different or strange or, or a little unique. How do I know if this is really an illness? Who's the person that's experiencing a common work? If it's impacting their ability to live their life in any way, even if it's only a little bit, that's when we suggest coming to talk to somebody to get support. Does that make sense to people? Like, yeah. Resident experts. You've heard me talk like three times, so you've got to be like pros to that. <laughs> so, what can we start to see when we cross into that impaired function, that impairing of those ADLs? In our workplace, we may start to see things like depression or even anxiety, two of the more common mental illnesses. Statistically, we know about one in 10 people in Canada will experience depression at some point in their life. It's probably closer to about 8%. People like round numbers, we say one in 10. Anxiety is well one of the more common mental illnesses we see in Canada. Soon as you would see, for an employee or a friend, and with depression, see a lowering of the mood, major changes in sleep or eating patterns. A lot of times people think with depression, well, that just means a uh, person sleeps all the time and they stop eating. But again, that's just not necessarily the case. We recognize that somebody experiencing depression could not be able to sleep at all, just can't get to sleep, or be eating way, way too much on healthy amounts. What we're seeing is a major change in their behavior, a real impairing of those ADMs. As well, it can be very common with people experiencing depression or thoughts of death or suicide. We're going to talk more about what we can do as employers or even just as community members to create a suicide safer community when talking about people experiencing thoughts of suicide. As well with anxiety, some really common symptoms. And again, I recognize I've condensed this really quickly, but I want to get through it on time because I'm sure we only have an hour for lunch. With symptoms of anxiety, we see things like a headache, a sore stomach, a chest pain, or even excessive worrying. Again, all very common symptoms. So, Jack, how does that impact work? If my employees or people I work with are experiencing this, how does that impact my work or my workplace? There's two key ways I've really highlighted here two key things we're going to see. One is absenteeism, which I think is pretty straightforward. The employee is experiencing these mental health concerns, possibly mental illness, and they're not able to come to work. And as a result, that's lost manpower. And the jobs that need to get done aren't getting done because we're trying to fill spots for a person that's not there. Another very common concern that can happen when people are experiencing mental distress or even mental illness is what we call presenteeism. So the person's there. They're at work. But because they're feeling that impairment, or they're experiencing, I should say, that impairment as a result of those symptoms we talked about, they're not able to do their job with their fullest potential. They're not able to do all the things they need to do. And as a result, we see reduced productivity. So again, because this person's not getting the support necessarily they need, not just from work, but possibly from other areas in their life, we're seeing reduced productivity. So they're there, 
but they're not really there. Is there any questions about those? I'd like to say questions at any time, just shout them out. But the value is I'm clear. I'm just nervous, right? So what can we do? There's three things I want to talk about that we can do. The first off, I want to talk about how we can reduce stigma surrounding mental illness in our work. The second thing I'm going to talk about, with a brief overview, is I want to talk about implementing the practices suggested in the psychological health and safety in the workplace standard. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it looks like, some of the benefits from implementing the standard, and how we can go about implementing it, whether we're an organization of 5,000 employees, or whether we're an organization of 10 employees. And lastly, we're going to talk about education opportunities that you can provide for your employees, or for yourself, to maintain or improve mental health and so first, I really want to talk about stigma. And I'll say that stigma is a Greek word. In ancient Greece, when someone committed a crime or an offense, they were branded with a mark, like a tattoo. And that mark was called stigma. It was meant to shame that person, to let everybody know this is a bad person. This person's not welcome here. They're not as good as us. They're not as smart as us. They're not as talented. We don't want them socializing or around the rest of us because they're not as good. When we talk about the stigma of mental illness, as a society, we can have all these stigmatizing ideas of what it means to live with a mental illness. These ideas of things like people with a mental illness are dangerous, that mental illness only affects the impoverished, or that people living with a mental illness are somehow responsible for it, or even that people are defined by their mental illness. I mean, I look at this list of things and I can pick them out at random and say, people with a mental illness are dangerous. And you know, we have studies and research that show you're actually much more likely to be the victim of a crime and actually commit on the mental illness. I can tell you what a study done actually in 2005 by Dr. Heather Stewart, I don't know if people are familiar with Dr. Stewart. She does a lot of research in the areas of, of mental illness and stigma. And what she wanted to do was she wanted to see if there was a correlation drawn between violent offenses or violent crime and mental illness. And what she did was she took a really broad scope of what she deemed a violent crime, even broader than I would even assess. So something like a property offense. So uh, I stole your bicycle, she deemed that a violent offense because someone was victimized in that offense. So a really broad scope of what they deemed violent crime. What she found in that study was that only 3% of violent crimes in the community could be attributed to someone living with a mental illness. That's 97% of violent crime everybody knows. But that misconception of what it means to live with a mental illness starts to skew how we view people. Mental illness only affecting the impoverished, if you look at something like type 1 bipolar disorder, we know it's twice as prevalent in high-income nations versus low-income nations. The simplest way for me to put it is mental illness doesn't care how much money you have in your pocket. People living with a mental illness are responsible for it, or even people are defined by their mental illness. So I can be a stickler for language sometimes, and I think language can be really powerful because it's something that we can change, and we can start to change the way we shape our views of mental illness. <laughs> We have stigmatizing vernacular, so there's things that we could say every day in common conversation that can have a really stigmatizing effect on somebody living with a mental illness. So just by a show of hands or a nodding of your head, let me know you're awake as well. Who's heard someone say, we know someone who's living with schizophrenia, so we say, oh yeah, Joe, Joe's schizophrenic. Heard that term before? Absolutely. But what have I done? What have I done in one, three word sentence? Labeled him. Good luck. Labeled. labeled him. I don't see Joe anymore. I see a schizophrenic. If Joe had cancer, I would never say, oh, Joe is cancer. Or Joe's the cancer guy. Because I see past a physical illness and I see a person. What I want for us to do as a society is come to that same place where we look past a mental illness and still see a person. Because I can tell you firsthand, again, working with people one to one, there are so many people who are experiencing these mental health concerns that will do anything to keep from being the something. You know, you can think of it in your workplace, but you can imagine somewhere like a high school of being the schizophrenic kid in high school. That label, that could be like to carry around your high school. People could lie about their symptoms and not what they're experiencing, not want to come forward and get help just to keep from being the something. A really simple thing we can do, and it starts maybe for us in our workplace, is start to challenge the language we use when we talk about someone living with schizophrenia. It's as simple as that. It's not Joe is schizophrenic, Joe has schizophrenia. Joe's living with schizophrenia, he's doing fine. That little challenge of language gives so much respect back to that person living with that illness. 
So that's my big thing. So there's one big thing we can do is start to reduce stigma, and we can actually do that very tangibly by just challenging language. Challenging language we hear and the language we use. I promise you the next time you hear, oh, he's a schizophrenic or she's a schizophrenic, that's going to be your ear wrong. So let's talk a little bit about the act. Or sorry, the standard. It's going to be an act. I get ahead of myself. Too excited. The Psychological Health and Safety in the Workplace Standard is a document prepared by the CSA. And it outlines a systematic approach to develop and sustain a psychologically healthy and safe workplace. It focuses on mental illness prevention and mental health promotion. And the standard is intended for everyone, whether or not they live with a mental illness. And there's two key things I really like in here. When I teach a course called the CIS, I talk about the different ways we can intervene and provide support. We talk about postvention, intervention, primary prevention is one of the best ways to promote and maintain mental health and wellness. And that's one of the big goals here. Mental health promotion and primary prevention. The other thing I love to see on here is that this standard is intended for everyone. The standard isn't meant to be implemented when we recognize someone struggling. This standard is meant to be implemented for an entire organization. This is meant for the betterment of every employee, not just the one that I think has told me is struggling. It is an important note, however, the standard is absolutely voluntary. However, I'm going to tell you guys all the really beneficial reasons that it would be in your best interest of your organization to start to implement some of the practices suggested in this standard. And I have heard whispers that this may be an act one day. So when I say act, I could be wrong anymore. Just a really quick overview of what's actually in the standard. They talk about psychological hazards, they talk about risk assessment, different implementation practices. We'll talk a little bit about that this afternoon. Talk about creating an organizational culture that's supporting mental wellness. Really that idea of starting to change an organizational culture, and that's actually one of the number one workplace factors that's identified within the, within the standard. And also a big piece too, and I'm sure if there's HR people or management in the room, sustainability and measurement review. I see people get a big smile when we talk about quality improvement and measurement review, and how it's going to benefit my organization. That's also tied in to the standard. So if we read the standard, they identify what they call key drivers. These are their four key drivers. I like to call them organizational benefits. These are four key ways that your organization is going to benefit from implementing these standards. Risk mitigation, you're going to have cost effectiveness, you're going to have benefits towards recruitment and retention, and you're going to see organizational excellence and sustainability, again, that quality improvement. Risk mitigation or risk reduction, we're going to start to see, again, reducing the level or the, the chance or likelihood, I should say, of psychological injury by having primary prevention. So again, not waiting for injury to occur, because again, we think about all the other standards and policies we have in place, they're not designed necessarily post preventative they're prevention. Slip trips and falls standards, those are to prevent falls, not to deal with what happens after, per se. That's a big focus of this act as well. Now, I'm just going to put this little stack up because that was really neat. So it is an American stat, so how we're doing it. The Gallup organization, they estimate that there are 22 million actively disengaged employees, costing the American economy as much as $350 billion per year in lost productivity, including absenteeism, illness, and other problems that result when employees are unhappy at work. So our presenteeism and our absenteeism is absolutely costing, at least the American economy, a lot of money. I'm pretty safe to say that we have similar statistics. Cost effectiveness again, you're going to see reduced levels of absenteeism and presenteeism. You're going to see people who are happier to come to work, and that's going to be more, again, beneficial for your organization. Recruitment and retention. Again, the idea that coming to work is, is a happier place to be. I'm feeling more productive, I'm feeling more supported. We're less likely to leave that job. We have studies, again, that show that it's an estimated cost between 50 to 150% of an employee's annual salary to replace them. Simply put, it's oftentimes much more expensive to replace an employee than to actually put money or put effort towards helping that employee succeed in their workplace. And lastly, organizational excellence and sustainability. Again, I really do want to emphasize there are tools within the standard that highlight how to measure the effectiveness of the standard and how to improve upon what we're already doing. There's a lot of stuff I'm sure your organizations are already doing. So sometimes I, I think there's almost a fear that comes with this standard, like, we're already tapped out. Does everyone here have nothing to do by the time they get to Friday, right? 
probably most of us. I don't care, I promise. No, I swan. <laughs> but by the time we get to Friday, we've got more and more to do. And this is just seen as one more thing to pile on to all those other jobs, tasks, responsibilities we have. We're going to talk about this isn't just one, the role of an individual, this is the role of a whole organization. And for the bigger picture, this is something that's going to benefit your organization and actually increase productivity. There are 13 what they call workplace factors, 13 areas that the standard focuses on to try to work towards improvement. And really for this afternoon, I'm not going to go into detail on every factor. If we were going to talk about education opportunities and what we can do, I have business cards. But for today, we're going to highlight the, the 13. So again, we see things like an organizational culture. So again, simply put, that's their number one, their number one factor. It's starting to change the culture and change the ideas surrounding what is mental health. This is something we can talk about, something that we all have, and everybody can experience mental distress or even mental illness. Again, to me, the key point of starting to change the conversation and eradicate or reduce really eliminates the we talk about psychological and social support. Clear leadership and expectations, things starting the standard. And again, this is probably all things that we've heard before, but that idea of employees are going to benefit when they have those clear expectations and clear message from, messaging from leadership. Another really point, important thing I'll maybe touch on now if I'm getting ahead of myself. It's really important with this standard that it's a top-down mentality. So this isn't just a pocket of the organization that we want to say really buys in to these standards. This needs to come right from the very top and flow down. There's buy-in at the highest levels so that when these practices or policies or things need to change or improve or be adapted, it's coming right from the top down and there's an entire buy-in. If there's not a buy-in from the top, it's very hard to implement the standard. It's very hard to implement anything without a buy-in. Civility and respect, I think, fairly straightforward. Understanding psychological demands. So to me, that ties up with workload management. Again, when we talk about this in relation to our organization at CMHA, this would be something where we want to take into account things like caseload management. So knowing how many clients a case manager is expected to support, and if they realize they're at a level that's too high or too stressful, do we have things in place that are going to help that, that case manager to help improve or maintain their mental health and wellness? Again, opportunities for growth and development. Recognition and reward, again, pretty straightforward, but again, the idea of employees want to know that they're doing a good job. And getting that positive feedback, having that recognition, oftentimes there's a lot of studies that show that recognition can do just as much as a people. Knowing that they're doing what they're supposed to do, knowing that they're doing a good job, that recognition, that little bit of keep it up, that's enough. That does a great, great thing to make them mental health involved. Involvement and influence are their work. Again, we talk about workload management, engagement. Again, I think this comes to the idea this isn't something that we want to have segregated to one area of organization, rather, this is something that needs to be brought across an entire from the very top to the bottom. Seeing balance, having psychological protection. Again, I think we're going to talk about education, education opportunities, and protection and physical safety. Again, these are essentially the 13 factors. And if you look through the standard, you'll see each in more detail. Again, for today's talk, we only have a bit longer, but if there's more questions, I'm more than happy to answer afterwards. <coughs> so that's great, Jack. How do we implement it? There's four key ways that the standards really suggest. They thought of everything. There's four key ways the standards suggest that we implement. One, leveraging our existing resources. What they, how they identify is to say, let's acknowledge or let's identify some mental health champions. Let's identify some people within our organization that are passionate about mental health and wellness. And they're going to be our mental health champions, and they're going to help lead this through our organization. They're willing to take this out of a little bit of responsibility, or they're willing to take on this project. And again, not just in one pocket. It doesn't have to be just human resources. It doesn't just have to be senior management. Anybody who identifies this, let's start to identify some mental health champions in our organization. We're going to see engaging leadership from labor and management. Again, that very simple idea. We want to see buy-in at every level. We want to embed it across the organization. And we want to close the accountability, accountability loop. There's four key ways to implement. Again, really when we're implementing anything in our workplaces, these are the four factors we're looking at. The standard is no different. The last thing I really want to talk about are education opportunities that, again, that are available to your workplaces or to your families, friends, colleagues, or just people in our community. 
So again, with my role with the organization, the, my primary role is education. I do teaching, public speaking, and I also offer certificate trainings. And there's three certificate trainings that they may be really interesting to some people, and you should see in front of you um, little yellow slips and our, our health promotion brochure as well. Those little yellow slips have some upcoming courses that I'll be teaching actually here in the world. The first one we'll talk about is our Safe Talk training. And Safe Talk stands for Suicide Alertness for Everyone. And it's a three hour course where we look to teach to people signs of suicide, so what the signs of suicide could be in somebody, and then how to connect that person to someone who can keep them safe. And that's a three hour course that we offer to companies, we offer that to workplaces, we offer that to students even as of late. I'll be teaching that later tonight for our high school teachers here in town. We offer them just for general community. So again, uh, for any of these it's simple as just contact me, I think it's on the slip. Another training I'll talk about is our assist training. That's applied suicide intervention skills training. That's almost the next level of training we talk about suicide intervention. That's a two day training, back to back two days. And not only do we learn to recognize the signs of suicide in somebody, we actually learn a model of care to help support this person through these thoughts and help develop a safe plan to do what we call keep them safe for now. So again, this is an, an intensive course. It's a two-day back-to-back course, but you actually leave the course with a model of care. So I leave the course learning something. I have a little, little card of paper that has that model you can work through to help support when a person comes to us and says, I'm thinking of suicide. We know what to say, we know what to do. In our mind to create a suicide safer community, in our grand scheme, if I had my way to be hearing it perfect, I'm sure Gary agreed too, we'd want to see almost everybody in this room safe talk. I want everybody in this room to at least know what the signs of suicide are and know when to pass off to somebody who can help. The next piece will be to have key people in that same room who are in this way, who when that person is brought to them, knows what to do, what to say, to develop that safe plan to keep them safe from now. If I equate this to a workplace, it's that same idea. I'd love to have everybody in my workplace have that safe talk training so they all know when someone could be experiencing thoughts of suicide, what to say, how to bring them to someone who can help, and then in that very same idea, that very same model, I have people in my workplace, key identified people who are assist trained, so that when someone's brought to them, they know exactly what to say, what to do to help support this person. For either of those trainings, it's simple as just contacting me, and I can let you know how to get in, how to get involved. The last certificate training I'll talk about, as well as our mental health first aid training, so again, this is another two-day certificate course. I should say at the end of all these three courses, you are certified. You get certificate. The certificate does not expire. We do encourage you to take it probably every three to four years just to stay current. But our mental health first aid training is a two-day course where you learn how to support somebody who's experiencing mental distress or a mental crisis. And again, you learn another model of care to help work through with that person. So exercises you may do in those two days would be something like um, teaching you how to work through somebody experiencing a panic attack or someone who's experiencing an onset of psychosis in the moment, how do we support that person? How do we connect them with someone who can help? So again, these are all courses that we offer right here in our community, and it's really just as simple as connecting with us as an organization. If I'm thinking of how to maintain or how to keep a healthy and mentally healthy workplace, it really comes down to the primary prevention, that mental health promotion. I have people in my organization that are trained and ready if we need that support. And I can assure you, these are really valuable courses to take. Having that credential, having that peace of mind, especially when I talk about the assist or the safety. That idea, if someone came to us right now, if someone, if we, if we wanted to imagine for yourself, if someone came to me right now and said, I think I'm gonna kill myself. Do we know what we would say, what we would do, what we could go to, or what we could work through? This course, when you leave, I can assure you, you leave this course with confidence, with a model, in your mind, knowing what to say, what to do, and how I can we also offer all kinds of different lunch and learns, much like today. So I come into your organization and talk just simply about mental health and wellness, about um, stress management, about the programs and services we offer at CMHA. And when we don't charge for any of those services, we always welcome donations to our organization. So with all that, oh, and lastly, I do want to talk about a really neat opportunity that's coming up in February. So in partnership with the Lumex Group, CMHA has come together to coordinate a conference on post-traumatic stress disorder, and specifically post-traumatic stress disorder affecting first responders. So I think we recognize that one of the most underserved communities or groups that we know right now, especially in Canada, we see the numbers coming in daily, are first responders. 
in accordance with people experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. What can we do? How can we best support? And how can we learn more? This is a conference with a lot of excellent speakers. Actually, on your table, there's the poster uh, and the media release. So if you're interested in attending this conference, I really implore you to take this back to your workplaces, take this to your friends, your colleagues, and let them know this is happening. It'll be in February the 19th and 20th at Elmhurst Resort. It'll be a two-day conference, again, with some fantastic speakers like that. Actually, the report on post-traumatic stress disorder uh, was one of the key authors of the report, Dr. Jetty, will actually be speaking at the event about PTSD <coughs> and the impact on first responders and community members of work. So all that information, with just 20 minutes, 15 for questions, and five out of the room, just like a pro. Remember that from my PA. <laughs> Is there any questions?